Uh, we now move to questions to the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. The Minister has given notice to the Business Committee that she is unavailable to answer questions. The Minister for the Economy will therefore respond to questions on her behalf today. I call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Deira Minister is aware of the recent remarks by the Chair of the Agri-Food Strategy Board in respect of the structure of the local industry. As the Minister has previously said in this chamber, she is focused on championing and, and strengthening the position of all farmers in Northern Ireland. The future of the industry is dependent upon building a resilient, sustainable, competitive and forward-thinking sector, and she will not be selective as to whom she supports. That is why the Minister is working with colleagues across the Executive to deliver the many actions detailed within the Executive response to Going for Growth, which are intended to assist the agri-food sector in realising its ambitions and maximising its potential contribution to the local economy. Mr. Speaker, farmers in particular will benefit from various schemes under the Rural Development Programme, especially the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which aims to build knowledge and expertise to improve innovation and cooperation, and to support capital investment in modern, fit-for-purpose infrastructure and equipment. The Minister was delighted to have launched the capital component of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme on 31 October. This initial phase is worth some £40 million and represents a significant investment in the future of farming here. Call Mr. Swan for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for his answer. In his role as Economy Minister, he's also co-sponsor of the Agri-Food Strategy Board. Does he agree with the, the Chairman's comments in regard to the number of farmers in Northern Ireland? I, I, I share the, um, Mr. Speaker, I share the views of the uh, Deira Minister, who I think responded at the last question time to a question posed by. Uh, Mr. Swan, this very issue. I, I fully agree with what she said in the chamber that day and reiterated here uh, today that she wants to see a, a strong, robust, resilient, sustainable farming sector uh, across Northern Ireland, and she will have no uh, favourites in terms of the, uh, or not be selective in terms of who she supports to achieve that ultimate positive aim. Uh, and the member is, is right that uh, I am co sponsor of the uh, Agri Food Strategy Board along with the Dairy Minister. And you know, whilst I, in this instance, don't agree with what the chair said to the, Agri or the DERA committee when he appeared before them in this house, um, I think it would be worth acknowledging the, the positive role that Mr O'Neill has played down through the years uh, in the industry, right across the sector, in a range of different roles, and particularly the role that he has played of late as the chair of the Agri-Food Strategy Board in developing the Going for Growth report, which points to a, a very positive vision, an ambitious vision for the future of the agri-food sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, and whilst I, like a lot of people, I said I might not agree with everything that they say, um, I'm happy to work with those who have that, want to make that ultimately want to make that positive co contribution to the sector and to the industry. And I think that's where, uh, in spite of what was said, I think that's where Mr. O'Neill's heart clearly lies. I call Mr. Justin McNulty. And thank the minister for his answer to date. Does the minister agree with the UK, UK's foreign minister George Eustace? when he says that agriculture, the agricultural industry will have to move away from the notion of subsidies. Yeah, I was, I was um, at a meeting uh, hosted by, um, a breakfast meeting hosted by um, Diane Dodds, our MEP, uh, in which Mr Eustace made a range of comments, including some comments not dissimilar to what the member has read out. I think you know, it is entirely for Mr Eustace to come forward in the context of the UK exiting the European Union. Uh, with um, positive, um, seizing the opportunities that presents, coming forward with positive uh, ways in which the whole uh, system of supporting farming and supporting the agri-food sector in Northern Ireland and right across the United Kingdom can be supported. And, and I look forward to uh, playing my part as economy minister. And I know that the Dara minister is already incredibly active in working with Mr. Eustace, who she has met on I think on several occasions now, to impress upon him the importance of the sector here in Northern Ireland. And the need to, whenever the UK exits the European Union, need to have a, 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 a good supportive system of support in place uh, that can ensure that our, our agri-food sector and indeed our fishing sector can, can thrive, not just survive, but thrive uh, as the UK exits the European Union. Oh, Ms. Linda Dillon. Um, good to can call you. Um, I, know, I know that you're not actually the Dara Minister, but I would certainly like to hear you saying a wee bit more in terms of, of farmers. I, I recognise you're the Economy Minister, and, and therefore you may have an eye to that more than you have to, to farmers. But 
I am concerned about what Tony O'Neill said, and I don't disagree with you on a lot of what you're saying about him. He, he's very good at what he does, and I think he has a lot to bring to the Agri-Food Strategy Board. However, the farmers out there, quite rightly, are very concerned by what, what he has said. And I suppose just if, what assurances can the Minister give us that farmers will get so, the support they need from the Department going into the future to ensure that they have equality of production and sustainability? I don't think you're, you're not going to hear me in whatever role I'm performing uh, stand up and agree with what Mr. O'Neill said in respect of the number of, of uh, farmers uh, that are needed in Northern Ireland. You know, I, I will reiterate again the, the views that the Dara Minister has expressed in, in this chamber already that you know, she wants to see a strong sector and she's not going to uh, support one sector over and above, not going to be selective in terms of. Uh, who she supports to achieve her ultimate aim of having a, a strong, resilient, sustainable um, farming sector in Northern Ireland. And, and, you know, Mr O'Neill has, has said what he has said, and I'm sure that he has had – I don't agree with what he said, nor does the minister agree with what he said. I think we've made that, made that pretty clear. And I'm sure that uh, if knowing even – I may not be dear a minister, but I, I know a bit about the farming sector and farming industry and what they – they're not shy about coming forward and saying what they believe. Uh, and I'm sure that many of them have already made their views very, very clear to Mr O'Neill in terms of what they think about what he said. Um, so I, I think what, you know, what has been said has been said, can be unsaid, uh, but what I think we need to do is move forward and work with Mr O'Neill and the Agri-Food Strategy Board, uh, which I've had the, the pleasure of meeting since taking up post as, as Economy Minister, and continue to work with them to implement the recommendations contained within Going for Growth uh, and to take the sector from strength to strength. Well, Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as a member may know, Minister McElveen received the Sustainable Agricultural Land Management Strategy at the launch event at AFB in Hillsborough on the Friday, the 21st of October. Minister McElveen and her officials will now consider this report carefully, examining the potential implementation of these recommendations to deliver her department's vision of a thriving and sustainable economy, environment, and rural community. It is clear that significant resources would be required if all of the recommendations were to be implemented. In a time of scarce public finances, Mr. Speaker, finding sufficient funding streams to match the ambition of this report will be challenging, but the Minister and her department appreciates that supporting growth in the agri-food sector also means supporting the environment which sustains that growth. Significant investment will also be required from the agri-food sector. However, if we can show clearly that such investment from the public and private sectors will have tangible and lasting rewards, then making the case for funding will be much easier. Mr. Speaker, however, it may be possible to carry out phased implementation of the report that will help to inform consideration of wider level implementation. Mr. Irwin, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. And can I ask the Minister, uh, could he outline how the, the Department could fund the implementation of the land use strategy? Mr. Mr. Speaker, at the the launch uh, back in October, uh, I understand that the Minister uh, gave a very clear commitment that she would carefully consider the report, and that's what she is, she is doing at present. Uh, and she, but also, not only would she consider the report, but also how the recommendations could actually be implemented. And, and, and clearly, um, that includes um, considering how it might be, might be funded. Uh, and there are a range of different ways in which the, the Minister is uh, bearing in mind that we are in times of some constraint in our budgets, and, and may be so for some time yet. Um, she is mindful of that, uh, but she is still looking at imaginative and creative ways in which she might be able to fund this important uh, piece of work. Uh, the department is, could consider using existing funding mechanisms, so for example the Rural Development Programme or the Environmental Farming Scheme where there seems to be an alignment, uh, and they both could be potentially used. Uh, she could, as I said in my original answer, carry out a phased implementation to help uh, inform consideration of, of wider uh, and more full implementation. Uh, and I know that there are business development groups in place at CAFRI which could help to provide feedback on the rollout of larger scale projects. And then finally, uh, as a report has been developed in, in response to a recommendation which was contained within the Agri-Food Strategy Board's Going for Growth report, um, I think there, is, there would be a reasonable expectation that the agri-food industry itself uh, would make a significant contribution to its implementation, the implementation of the strategy, particularly whenever uh, as I mentioned already, it, it's clear that you know, the evidence, if they have, particularly where the evidence can be shown that this produces better outcomes, more productivity for the agri industry, then it is something which I'm sure that they will be will be keen to be involved in. 
Well, Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the views of, on the often overbearing nature of the NIEA and their unwarranted treatment of farmers, what assurances can the Minister give that this strategy will not result in the further hounding of the farming community? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, the DR Minister wouldn't want to implement anything that was over bureaucratic and uh, brought more burden of red tape and regulation onto the farming industry. The objective of the strategy, as I understand it, has been, as I indicated to um, Mr Irwin, about trying to uh, sketch out a direct direction of travel and put in place an action plan which would lead to more productivity, but also understanding that um, that productivity will in large part depend on looking after the environment where that productivity comes from, where, where, where the agri-food produce comes from. Um, I know that the, um, the strategy has been, as I said before, flowing from the recommendations, a specific recommendation contained within Growing for Growth. Going for Growth, that of course was a document that was produced with input from uh, the farming community, with uh, some former presidents of the Ulster Farmers Union, for example, sitting on that board. Um, so they would have been mindful of that, I'm sure, on the issue in terms of bureaucracy whenever they were coming forward, Mr Speaker, with this recommendation. Uh, and I know that the, the strategy group itself, the land management strategy group itself, headed up by John Gilliland, uh, was very careful in taking the views and considering the views of the farming community. Uh, and I think that that is reflected in the recommendations that are contained within the, the final report. Uh, um, but I'm sure that uh, the Minister will, in, in, in trying to take forward this report, which she is, she is now considering, I'm sure that's something that she will be exceptionally mindful of and wouldn't want to be putting in place something which would have a positive aim but might have neg some negativity in terms of how it might be implemented. Call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can I, uh, can I thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far? Minister, you, you are aware that the, 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 there's increasingly it has now been coming into a two-tier system of farming with hill and lowland. Can you guarantee the House here that any strategy that is brought out will not affect the hill farmer and his unique way of farming? I, I, I'm sure, the, as I said in response to, to Mrs. Dobson, I, I'm sure the Minister wouldn't want to be implementing a strategy which has negative impacts on any sector of, of farming, uh, never mind negative impact on the environment in which they farm. Um, and I'm sure that the points that the, the member may, raises in respect of hill farming will be something that the Minister will, will carefully consider. As she's only received the port, report in the last couple of weeks as a member. Uh, will appreciate. I think the, the group is to perhaps present to the Agriculture Environment Committee in the not too distant future. And I'm sure those are issues that you might want to take forward in discussion with the, the group whenever they come before the committee. Um, and bearing in mind what, what, what consideration they would have given to, to that issue as they were developing the report. But I'm, I'm, I am pretty sure that the minister, if she was here, would say that she won't, won't want to be implementing anything that would neg negatively impact upon any uh, aspect or area of our farming community. Call Mr. Jerry Mullen. Uh, Minister, I appreciate that the Minister of Deira Agriculture and the rural, uh, whatever the title is, has a lot of reports to consider. Uh, but w can you give us any indication mm -hmm. as to when she does finish all her considerations, uh, when she proposes to bring forward her proposals around the sustainable land management strategy to the House for discussion and debate? I don't believe the member. I struggle with it uh, my, myself. Um, you know, the, 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 the member will appreciate that the minister, I think, received this uh, report on the 21st of October. It's not that long ago, um, um, and, and I'm sure that the member in the house will beg your indulgence to take some time to carefully consider all of the recommendations. And, and as I pointed out in response to Mr. Irwin's original question. Um, it is important that she bears in mind the, the cost impl implications of implementing it. It would be um, probably unwise to come forward with a report where she didn't have any understanding or appreciation of where it might be funded from. Um, so she, she would need to take that into consideration, as well as all the wider impacts that, that members from around the House have raised. So I think if the, the member gives the minister some forbearance after having re uh, just received it on the 21st of October, um, I'm sure she will not delay in coming forward with her, her consideration, and more so than that, her, her conclusions and her way forward in implementing the strategy. Call Mr Paul Frew. Mr Speaker, the TV Strategic Partnership Group was established in 2014 to develop a comprehensive and practical long-term bovine TB eradication strategy and implementation action plan. 
to progressively reduce TB levels in the Northern Ireland cattle herd and ultimately eradicate the disease here. TB is an uh, extremely complex disease. There are many different factors that contribute to its spread, and new research and evidence about these factors is emerging all the time. The group have been tasked with developing a long-term strategy which will set out how we should tackle bovine TB over the coming decades. It is therefore imperative that the group is afforded the opportunity to get this right, to ensure that its recommendations are sound, evidence-based and sustainable in the long term. In order to do that, the group engaged with a wide range of stakeholders, scientific and veterinary experts, representative organisations and interested parties. They have spoken to international experts dealing with uh, bovine TB in other countries, and they consulted on the emerging recommendations in their interim report in 2015. Having considered the responses to the consultation, they further developed their thinking and have now engaged independent consultants to evaluate their recommendations. Minister McElveen has already held an introductory meeting with the group, and I have recently written to the Minister to outline their plans to formally present her with their strategy and associated implementation plan in December. The group are also liaising with the ERA committee to arrange a briefing on their final strategy. Call Mr. Frew for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker, can I ask the Minister, uh, can he update the House in any way around the test and vaccinate or remove project which is currently going through the ERA, and something that I pushed very hard when I was chairperson of the Art Committee? I can recall the member being chair of the, of the um, art committee, and it was an issue that he, he took an interest in at that time, because um, it, it is an issue that does have a, such a devastating impact on, on many farmers, and obviously has a, a significant impact as well on the public purse in terms of the compensation scheme. The, the five-year wildlife intervention research project was designed to consider the effects of a, um, a test, vaccinate, and remove approach on badgers in areas of. Well, firstly, high confirmed levels of TB, secondly, where there was a high cattle herd density, and finally, where there was a high badger density. In year one, there were some 630 badger captures, 280 of which were unique. Um, at that time, there were no badgers removed, as a member will be aware of. All were sampled, however, microchipped, vaccinated, and then released, and that gave baseline data for the rest of the project. In year two, there were 692 captures, 341 of which were unique. Years one and two's reports have now been published on the DRA website. Uh, the project ran in year three from the June 16th to uh, the middle of October this year. Uh, and I know that there have been some issues with the shortage of, of vaccination. Uh, and the Welsh Government kindly stepped in and helped out the um, Northern Ireland Department uh, with a supply of vaccination. And the Minister, I know, is currently considering options for year four to ensure that there is sufficient vaccination in place. Call Mr. Harold McKay. Does the Minister accept the eradication of TB? and not just reduction, must be the executive's goal. So will the minister commit to making that a target within the next programme for government? I'm sure the, um, the minister wants to, as I've, as I've said already, wants to ultimately have the ultimate aim of eradicating the disease. Uh, and she knows the, the impact um, from now as minister, but also as a constituency member, the impact, that a devastating impact that uh, diagnosis of bovine t TB can have on a farm and have on a uh, farming business, um, as well as the cost that it has on the, the public purse, not least in her, her department. Uh, so ultimately, eradication is the aim that the minister will have. Uh, you know, I think that you know she she is, as I've already outlined, going to wait for the group to come forward with its final report and its impl most importantly, uh, Mr. Speaker, the implementation plan which will lead to not just reducing it, but ultimately, it would be hoped, eradication. And a member will know um, from his background that it is a deeply challenging thing. It's something that, that many jurisdictions are dealing with and many are struggling to deal with as well. And I think that's the, the important point, that, that, that this is not one very various countries. England have taken one approach. Wales are taking a different approach. Northern Ireland will have to take an approach that's tailored to our particular circumstances. But there will be no doubt that ultimately the aim is Notwithstanding all of the difficulties and challenges that there will be inherent within it, the ultimate aim is the eradication of the disease from Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I congratulate the Minister on the way he's performed so far. Um, just ask the Minister, could he, could he, could he outline uh, what cost it is to the Department in relation to TB and also whether or not he plans to uh, review the current compensation measures? Yeah, I, I don't have the um, exact figures here, but I, I'll make sure that they're provided to the member and to the House. But I, I think the, the approximate cost, annual cost, is around £30 million a year. It has been fluctuating around that figure 
over the last number of years. So whenever I say it's a, it's a huge cost to the public purse, I think the, that, those sort of figures bear that out. I think that the, my understanding is the department has some uh, baseline funding for um, compensation for TB, but it always exceeds that on a year-to-year -year basis. And the department and the former uh, department are sitting in front of the member will recall having to make bids for on a pretty regular basis. And in every, I remember as finance minister having to meet those bids from monitoring rounds um, for compensation over and above what was already within the department's baseline. It has been costly. It has fluctuated, obviously, over the years, but it is in around sort of high 20s to, to low 30 million pounds a year. And that's why I think it's important that, you know, that, that is unsustainable in the long term. I think it's important uh, that the plan that has been put in place is, is, is evaluated, is, is looked at, and that the minister takes a look at the strategy group's uh, report, and more importantly, its implementation plan, takes that forward with an aim to reducing it and therefore reducing the bill over time, but ultimately eradicating it and not having any bill for the Northern Ireland Executive at all. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlover. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister uh, what recent discussions the Minister or indeed the Department has had on the availability of the Bacillus calmet guernet vaccine for the purpose of preventing the spread of TB in the Badger population? And I can appreciate you may not have it readily at your fingertips today, Minister. I suspect I know as much about that as the member does. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and he's absolutely right. I, I don't have that information either in my head or in, in front of me. But look, what I'll do is I'll make sure that the Minister uh, writes to the member in good time and provides him with that information. Well, Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Question four. Mr. Speaker, Minister McAveen announced in June that she will uh, not reduce the basic payment scheme to fund in areas of natural constraint scheme under Pillar 1 of the CAP. She also announced at the time that a Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 transfer to fund in areas of natural constraint scheme in Pillar 2 under the Rural Development Programme will not be introduced. The Minister is therefore still considering other options that might be available. Given the pressure on both the Department's and the Executive's budget, providing any additional support will be challenging. Long-term value for money cannot be ignored, nor indeed the redistribution of Pillar 1 monies, which is already occurring as a result of the transition towards flat rate support in Pillar 1. Well, Mrs Barton for a supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, as you have said, the Minister she keeps considering saying she is considering options, but uh, that is little comfort to our farmers and landowners who are currently waiting for a decision. Minister, can you, in your role as Economy Minister, give us a decision on the funding? Now, can I just, uh, the, the Minister is not here to answer in his role as the Economy Minister. No, I, I thank, thank you for that, Mr. Speaker. I am mindful of, um, the Member has tempted me into committing my colleague to certain things. It's very dangerous. Uh, position for the Minister to, to, be to give me that, but I'm not going to do that as, as guided by the, by the Speaker. Look, I, I can well understand why the, the Member has raised the question. When I look at the, the data in front of me in terms of uh, the current area of natural constraint scheme, it's, it's uh, businesses within her constituency, some 2,708, who have received support of over, I think it's around about £5.3 million. Pounds. So I can well understand why the Member uh, would raise the question and raise the question in the way that she does. You know, I, I, I think the Member is, or the Minister, sorry, is rightly taking her time to carefully consider this issue. Um, she has made it clear, and I think for very good reason, um, as I've outlined in the answer, very good reason why she doesn't want to fund it under Pillar 1, why she doesn't want to do a Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 transfer uh, because of the pressures that are already on, on Pillar 1, um, and therefore she is looking at other options that might be available to her. And I accept um, that there will be many who, including mem many of the members' constituents, who will be waiting for an answer, and hopefully a positive answer in this respect, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure the member will appreciate and understand and therefore communicate to those people um, that there are good reasons, good valid reasons in my view why the Minister hasn't agreed to do uh, funding out of Pillar 1 or switch from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2. Uh, and, and she is also under immense, like all Ministers are, immense pressures elsewhere within their budgets. Uh, but be assured that the, the Minister is, is taking her time to carefully consider what options might be available to her, and she, including, I'm sure, uh, considering a bid during the upcoming budget round. Paul, Mrs. Michelle Gildernew. I um, thank the Minister for his response thus far and to ask him in light of what he has said, is he as an Executive Minister and the ADR Minister aware of the importance of the areas of natural constraint scheme, especially um, with the, the fear and the 
concern that is out there in light of the EU referendum result? I think, look, I, I think the, the Minister is aware of the concerns that, that many farmers in many parts of Northern Ireland uh, have about the continuance or, or, or a new future new scheme. Um, and that's why she's, she is still considering she hasn't ruled out a scheme completely. Uh, that's why she is carefully considering it, notwithstanding the, the restraints and, and pressures that she is facing on her budget, and I think the very valid reasons why she has decided not to take the money from elsewhere. Uh, but the, the Minister is, is taking her time to, to look at other options, uh, and I'm sure will, uh, in due course, come forward with her, her finalised view in respect of uh, what the future might hold. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Mr. Speaker, question number five, please. Mr. Speaker, the main actions taken to improve the water quality and habitat conservation of the Cons water are delivered as part of the North Eastern River Basin Management Plan. Measures involve working to improve understanding of the pressures in the area and improve the evidence to target actions in an effective way. Most of these measures require working with other departments or organisations, and key to delivery is active engagement with stakeholders through partnerships and catchment projects. Specific actions include working with the water industry to minimise the pollution risk from combined storm overflows, points on the sewer network designed to overflow in the event of blockage or very wet weather. Other actions include providing guidance and information to help communities protect and enhance local streams and rivers in the urban environment. Mr. Speaker, an example of specific actions in the Cons water includes rubbish removal from the river, areas of semi-natural habitat created, management and control of invasive species and new improved bridges and crossings. As part of the Greenway project, large areas of the river, uh, rivers have been improved by removing sections of historic concrete channels and creation of more natural river courses. Over time, this will improve the biodiversity and water quality of the rivers. NIEA is currently working with Northern Ireland Water to address a number of discharges to the Cons Water. The pollution hotline number is publicised on signage within the Cons Water Greenway to allow the reporting of pollution. NIEA is a key partner in the Department for Infrastructure's Living with Water programme, which aims to contribute to the improvement in the quality of water in the Belfast Lock catchment area, which includes con the Cons Water. NIEA officers continue to have good links with Cons Water Community Greenway staff and is hosting a stakeholder workshop on the 15th of November for the North Eastern catchment area at Mossy Mill to identify future partnerships. Call Mr. Douglas for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his, his uh, answers thus far. Um, and certainly, the Minister mentioned about the, the clear up of some rubbish on the, the Conswater River. Certainly, there at the Sam Thompson Bridge, some people talked about the, the bridge uh, was going nowhere. And we've had nearly 500,000 people walking over it. So, um, I, I welcome the, the work that's been done there. But could the Minister maybe outline to the House what progress is taking place in terms of the flood alleviation scheme? The, the member who I know is very familiar with the, the Greenway problem as much from cycling uh, around it. I'm looking forward to cycling at its full length uh, when it's constructed. Um, but one of the benefits of, of the overall project um, has been the, the flood alleviation scheme, and significant parts of, of East Belfast's uh, flood alleviation scheme are being delivered as part of the Conswater Community Greenway project. Uh, the overall scheme um, seeing an investment of £12 million, and that will uh, alleviate the impact of flooding on nearly 1,700 homes. Uh, and that was due to be complete early next year. Uh, 270 pro properties uh, which are adjacent to Orangefield Park and Victoria Park uh, are already benefiting from, from upgrades, and that was a uh, £1.7 million uh, element of the overall project. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this is good, positive work, uh, and, and I know that the Minister would particularly want to welcome the, the good collaboration that there has been between a range of departments here, including our own, uh, and also Belfast City Council and the Conswater Community Greenway Trust. Well, Mr. Short, Sean Lynch, I have to advise the Minister that we need a quick response. Yeah, good, man. good to can't call you. Will the Minister assure this Assembly that the water quality and ha habitat conservation will continue to have priority in all our inland waterways? Good man, good. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm sure that the, the Minister will always want to ensure that water quality is, is one, of, one of the things that's highest on her agenda as uh, she's looking to fulfil her duties in terms of protecting and enhancing our, our local environment. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I think it's fair to say today that he has demonstrated that he is capable of answering questions on anything, apart from maybe how he voted in Brexit. But given that we're here now almost a year after the historic 
COP21 agreement and a few days uh, since that agreement came into force. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister, or is the Minister, aware and able to uh, outline to the House the Executive's view on the need for Northern Ireland specific climate change legislation? Yeah. The, I thank the member for his, um, um, his initial remarks. Um, and, you know, I, I, think that I, I believe, and I've always believed, and I think it's the, the view of the, the Minister as well, that Northern Ireland does not need specific climate change legislation for Northern Ireland. Um, legislation to address climate change is already in place in, in the form of the UK's Climate Change Act, which was passed into law back in, in 2008. And, and the member, given his, his past job as Environment Minister, will be aware of the ambitious long-term targets that were contained uh, within that piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% over 1990 levels by 2050, right across the, the UK. Uh, and it also makes a requirement for, for Northern Ireland to produce a um, climate change adoption program that addresses our uh, particular risks and opportunities. Northern Ireland continues to play its fullest role in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions as part of the overall UK reduction. The latest greenhouse gas inventory published in, in June of 2016 shows a reduction of 17.4% from 1990 levels and updated projections published last year show that we are broadly on track to achieving our programme for government target, which was set by the previous executive of a 35% reduction by 2025. Um, you know, I, I think the member is, is an, or ought to be well aware of the particular circumstances and issues that we face in, in Northern Ireland in terms of our, our much larger agri-foods industry compared to that across the water issues that we have in terms of uh, in, um, manufacturing uh, sector within our economy and also issues around transportation. Um, I certainly don't want to see any piece of legislation passing around the Northern Ireland specific climate change bill that would impede on our economic development or, or could have the perverse consequence of increasing problems elsewhere. Because if we're not, if our agri-foods industry can't grow, then we're going to have to import food from somewhere else and that's going to impact on carbon and, and uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions elsewhere. I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. I call Mr Durkin for his supplement. I, I thank the Minister for his answer. The, the, the Minister will be aware that we are the only region on these islands that does not have its own specific climate change legislation, and our reliance on the agri-food industry, for example, is very similar to that of the Irish Republic. Uh, would the Minister accept at all that Northern Ireland specific climate change uh, legislation and Northern Ireland specific targets for uh, the reduction of emissions could be and should be actually beneficial to our economy as well as to our environment? Just because, because others have decided to do something, that's a matter entirely for them, um, and that's what devolution is about. It is uh, for us to decide in Northern Ireland what we want to do for Northern Ireland and not slavishly follow what, what others do. Um, we are making good when the member mentions about targets, and, and, and I remind him again uh, that the last programme for government did have a target, 35% reduction by uh, 2025, and all indications are that the executive is on course to have that 35% reduction on 1990 levels in place by, by 2025. Um, so I, I don't accept, and I'm sure the Minister would agree, that there is a need for Northern Ireland to have its own piece of legislation. Northern Ireland is making a contribution, as the evidence shows, and it's making a contribution as part of the overall UK uh, piece of legislation. Call Mr Keith Buchanan. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can the Minister update the House on how DERA plan to open up and allow more dairy and pig farmers uh, into discussion groups under the Farm Business Improvement Scheme? Mr. Speaker, the, the, uh, the Minister, uh, as the Member and, and many in the House will know, announced on the 27th of October uh, that the Farm Business Improvement Scheme uh, business development groups will reopen uh, uh, to dairy, both dairy and uh, pig farmers in the middle of November. The business development groups um, bring farmers together to share knowledge and skills to help them make informed decisions about adopting new technologies and developing their businesses. Uh, this additional tranche is, is aimed at dairy and pig farmers because farm gate prices, as the House will know, for both sectors have been below the cost of production for a significant period of time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, further details on the, the reopening of the business development group scheme uh, will be published uh, in the coming weeks and I think will be, will be made known through the uh, various farming and agricultural press. Mr. Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank the Minister uh, for his answer so far. Uh, many pig farmers obviously will welcome this news. Uh, does the Minister agree with me 
that the pork industry uh, welcomes efforts made by the Minister visiting China and making an effort on their behalf to open new markets for Northern Ireland? The, the Minister is in, is in very regular contact with the, the pork industry and, and as it were, all of the export aspirations that they have. She's, she's working very, very hard uh, on an ongoing regular basis to target access to, to key uh, strategic markets, including her, her mission to China, which is what she, where she is at the minute and why she's not here. So she gets to go to China. I get to come here and talk to you. Um, um, the world is ill David, I think. Um, but uh, she's there, of course, to, to promote the best of, of what Northern Ireland has to, to offer and to help move forward the final approval for, for export to, of Northern Ireland pork to China. And a very lucrative market uh, it is anticipated to be. I think it, there's some estimates that it could be worth an additional £10 million to uh, the pork industry in Northern Ireland. And given the uh, where prices have been for some time, that would be a much, much welcome boost, boost to the industry here in Northern Ireland. Prior to leaving uh, for, on her mission to, to China, she met with the Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Pork and Bacon Forum, uh, who indicated that the industry were very supportive of her mission, as am I, and um, not just generally, but particularly in my role as, as Economy Minister. I think it's incredibly important that uh, we begin to look beyond um, not just our own region, not just beyond the British Isles, not, um, but well beyond Europe as well, particularly to uh, strong and emerging markets like China, uh, and particularly for the agri-food sector, where I think there are huge opportunities in markets like China and elsewhere. Mr. Edwin Poots is not in his place. Question number four has been withdrawn. I call Ms. Nicola Mallon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to go back to a topic um, raised by my colleague, Mr. Um, McNulty. Can I ask the minister, um, does he agree with the position of the British farming minister, George Eustace, that we should end the notion of subsidies for our farmers? I don't think I've ever got the chance to, to say this in this house, but uh, Mr. Speaker, I refer the member to the answer I gave some moments ago. Call Ms. Mallon for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The reason, and I will go back to answer it, is I was unclear, and that's why I asked the question again. But can I then ask the minister, does the executive stand over the agriculture's minister's statement during the referendum that agriculture here relies on subsidies and there is no reason why these would cease outside the EU? Given that, can he shed any light on how much that will be given in subsidies to Northern Ireland farmers and for how long post any Brexit? You know, I, I think the, the, the issue of supporting our, you know, regardless of whether the UK is in or outside of the European Union, we have a, an agri-food sector, an agri-food industry that is, requires support. Uh, and I, I look forward, and I, I know that the, the Minister is working very, very hard in close consultation with the industry here in Northern Ireland. She and I uh, co-chair a Brexit consultative group, a uh, consultative committee, uh, which brings forward a range of stakeholders from right across the sector. Uh, to take their views, to take the temperature of the industry, to identify the particular challenges and opportunities that their sector in Northern Ireland has. Uh, and, and amongst those issues that they raise and others raise with us are, is the need to have a, a, a support scheme in place uh, post the UK leaving the European Union. Uh, and I look forward to that being a much less bureaucratic, uh, much less difficult to operate scheme than the one that is currently in place. Well, Mr. Jim Wells. <coughs> the Minister, no doubt, is aware of the prevalence of Rees Munchak in his own constituency. <coughs> what steps is his department or the Minister's department taking to eradicate this extremely invasive species? For raising the issue, it's, it's one that um, the department is very aware of, and as a member uh, identifies, Mr. Speaker, it's, a, it's an invasive species native to parts of Asia, and one wonders how it ends up here in, in Northern Ireland. It was introduced, uh, I think, in, in the early 20th century, and the species has, has since spread uh, rapidly. The species negatively impacts woodland um, and is a cause of increased traffic collisions with, um, with deer. The department is taking a number of actions with respect to Munchak deer, and these include specific action at local level, surveillance activity, and research when necessary. The, de the department has also developed an exclusion strategy and contingency plan, plan for a range of non-native deer, including the Munchak. Um, the, there is a, a member mentions my own strength for constituency. The Mount Stewart Munchak Action Group was established back in 2010 and in response to increased sightings in this particular area. Uh, comprises, it comprises departmental officials, academic state, academics, state landowners, and environmental NGO interests. Uh, and a, a Munchak Deer Action Plan for the Mount Stewart National Trust site and adjacent properties was developed, Mr. Speaker, and is currently being implemented by both National Trust and Forest Service staff, along with five other. Uh, registered volunteer marksmen approved by the group's selection criteria. 
Call Mr. Wells for a supplementary. I'm sure this isn't an issue that the minister is having sleepless nights about, but it is serious in the sense that this species in the rest of the United Kingdom is causing severe damage to both forestry and to farmland. Has he any idea, or can the Northern Ireland Environment Agency give us any indication as to how many breeze moons check are currently in Northern Ireland? Mr. Speaker, I don't have a, uh, a number about. Um, there's, obviously, there's, there's some estimates around um, identifying areas in which it is located, and the member has mentioned uh, the Ards uh, Peninsula, um, the, where there's a concentration of them. There is. Um, I don't, there, there is 103, I'm just trying to, I don't think there, anybody knows exactly how many there are, but there have been 103 reported records of Munjak deer sightings uh, on the database of the Centre for Environmental Data and, and Recording. Um, however, not all of these records have been verified, and of course there could be duplicate sightings contained within that. So um, there is a significant enough issue that's been identified as an issue and a problem by, by the department, hence our uh, work on the, um, the Mount Stewart group that I mentioned. Uh, and we're working very, very closely uh, with all of those stakeholders to, to do our very best to eradicate this very worrying, troubling, dangerous uh, invasive species. Call Mrs. Naomi Law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware um, of the concerns uh, with members of the public um, around the continued use of snares, which are, have been shown in recent research not to just be indiscriminate and cruel, but also a very inefficient way um, to use pest control. Um, could the Minister indicate whether the Department has any intention of bringing forward a complete ban on snares? The, I recognise, as the, the Member does, I'm sure, too, that the issue of, of, of snares is a, a very emotive uh, subject. On, on one hand, you have uh, many particularly animal welfare groups who um, will argue that their, their use often results in the indiscriminate uh, suffering and killing of, of, of non-target species, uh, such as badgers or hares or even, uh, in some occasions, domestic pets. Uh, and such, such groups have uh, long-standing campaigns, Mr. Speaker, for an outright ban on, on snares. On the other hand, then, you will get uh, land managers, farmers, country sports organisations who see snares as a very necessary uh, and very cost-effective means of protecting livestock, particularly lambs, uh, and also from uh, game birds, from, from foxes. In Northern Ireland, the use of, of snares uh, is regulated at current by the Wildlife Northern Ireland Order 19, 1985, which has been subsequently uh, amended. Uh, there was a debate, I think, during the passage of uh, wildlife or uh, welfare of animal legislation in this House in the previous mandate uh, around the continued use of snares, uh, primarily arguments around the, the uh, welfare concerns that the member has spoken about, um, and the usual arguments were, were put forward. Uh, this, the Assembly obviously decided that snares should remain a legal means of capturing uh, pest animal species. And I, I, um, I think given all of that, the, uh, the, the Minister, my understanding is the Minister has no plans to ban snares. Um, and therefore, there are two basic options left. One is maintaining the status quo, or, also, or the other option is to introduce additional measures um, along um, the lines sort of, uh, of trying to, um, trying to uh, look at the system a lot more to try to see if there's anything to be done to, to improve it um, in whatever way is possible, with, short of an outright ban. Call Mrs. Long for a supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister for his response, and clearly it is disappointing because I think um, that an outright ban would be better given that they are an inefficient means of pest control whilst they may be cost effective. However, if I could ask the Minister, in terms of potentially um, limiting the use of snares and introducing further restrictions um, to limit cruelty, for example, regular checks on snares and limitations to closures, when does he expect that the Department will be able to bring those regulations forward? Mr. Uh, the, 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 the Act uh, gave the Department powers to set uh, certain standards in the use of snares. Uh, the order places additional requirements on anyone who uses snares, including that all snares must be fitted with permanent safety stops and, and must not be set in a manner where the animal is likely to become fully or partially suspended. The draft order requires the agreement of the Assembly to be brought into force by, by way of affirmative resolution. And I'm aware that uh, the Minister's predecessor in the Department of the Environment had undertaken some further consultation with stakeholders after the public consultation had finished in order to assist uh, the then Minister on deciding the way forward. Um, so the, the Minister has, I understand, decided to take the snares order forward and officials are working on, on the legislation uh, currently. Now I'll get the, the, the Minister, I'll ensure that the, the Minister writes to the member in terms of updating her in respect of what the time scale for that might be. Members, that concludes topical questions. Time is up.